Okay, everybody, if you would join me in the blessing over the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher bakar v'nu mikoh ha'amin, v'natan lanu et terato, Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah, amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. We are in the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, and chapter one. And it says from the complete Jewish Bible, Adonai called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any of you bring an offering to Adonai, you may bring your animal offering either from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he must offer a male without defect. He is to bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting so it can be accepted by, uh, be accepted by Adonai. He is to lay his hand upon his head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for sin for, for him. He is to slaughter the young bull before Adonai, the, and the sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, are to pre present the blood. They are to splash the blood against all sides of the altar, which is by the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to skin the burnt offering and cut it in pieces. The descendants of Aaron, the Kohen, are, the Kohen, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. The wood which is on, on the fire on the altar. Boy, I tell you, my glasses. <laughs> the sons of Aaron, the Kohen, are to arrange the pieces the head and the fat on the wood which is on the fire on the altar he is to wash the entrails and lower parts of the legs with water and the Cohen is to cause all of it to go up in smoke on the altar as a burnt offering it is an offering made by fire a fragrant aroma for Adonai the blessing after the reading from the Torah Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah timet, vechaye olam, natabotekanu, baruch atah Adonai, noten ha-Torah, amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. They've already been sent out. <clears throat> Tyler, check trash. Julia, check trash or junk mail. But everybody, the notes were sent out like about, okay. They were sent out earlier today. Okay, everybody, we are in the book of Vayikra. Oh, I won't have time right now, but thank you. I'll put it over here. Okay. Amen. Oh, okay, this parasha lays out the laws of sacrifices. Okay, everybody, Vayikra Leviticus is the third book of the Torah. You know, um, I'll tell you one thing. I was reading uh, some commentaries from uh, from the rabbis, and uh, and they're all in agreement that if you don't study Vayikra, you're not studying Torah. You're not studying the Bible. It's uh, there's a lot of uh, Christian uh, pastors out there that they avoid uh, Leviticus. Because, you know, for one thing, they say, oh, it's all been taken care of at the cross. Uh, we don't need to understand the, the sacrificial system. 
But, uh, you know, and, and the thing is, if you really believe that Torah is from Genesis to Revelation, every book is important. So, uh, but um, I love it here because uh, with all of you that have gone through uh, these Torah portions and, uh, you know, for, for so many years, uh, we are constantly coming back and we're going through it and it, it opens our eyes to, uh, to new things. And, uh, and today, I mean, I realize today we are going to get into Hebrews too, but, uh, but it's very important that we understand as much as possible uh, the book of Leviticus. Um, you know, I like what the Didache says when it tells you, you do the best you can. You know, and we're always constantly getting closer and closer to doing. I mean, we're always doing the best we can. Um, okay, go ahead. I just all I gave was one little comment. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this, we're off. <laughs> and we're off we're and off. off and running. Go ahead, Tila. This was really I, this was really exciting uh, for me for last night because I right. I was I looked into the midrash and, and at the very beginning in the in the introduction it said. This issue, this is issued for our benefit in order to refine us and purify our character. Amen. And I started thinking about that. And it's like, you know, and just a real quick little tiny story. Speak my, right, right into it. Yeah. My my brother and I, when we were young, you know, 10, 11 years old, okay. And we I know this is we like to build model airplanes and cars and stuff, you know. I was very methodical. I would read the instruction and put each little thing together. But my brother, who's a year younger, he would put all this together and he'd have pieces left over in his kit. I love your brother. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so when I am reading this, it's like, you know what, you know, you know, whatever how they laid, you know, laid everything in that. But you know what? If we do what God says to do and we follow his instruction, we're gonna learn something new every time. Amen. Every time Amen. and we'll grow. In, yep. his, in his character. I mean, you know, our, our God is so precise that uh, he wants us to do it his way. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, your brother and I, we would have been zapped out of there in two seconds because we, <laughs> you know, he doesn't want us to do it our way. He wants us to do it his way. So you're absolutely right. I, I read the Midrash too. And, uh, and it, it's good because, like I said, it, it, it one thing it does specify is how important it is to study the word. Regardless, yeah, we did Genesis. Genesis is great. Then we went to Exodus. It's great. And then there's a lot of people who get into uh, Leviticus. Then it's like, oh, my gosh, whew, you know, I'm I'm going to bypass this and go on to numbers. And uh, yes. Yes, we'd like to. Okay. Can't go ahead and unmute and make a comment. Nope, I guess maybe not. <clears throat> okay, Kent, we're just going to move on then. Kent, are you snoozing, Kent? <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I didn't raise my hand. Maybe I accidentally put my hand up. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let me just go on then. We have gone through both Genesis and Exodus. Okay. But before we begin this Torah portion, let's backtrack to the previous chapter. At the end of the last parasha in the book of Exodus, uh, let's end it properly. Okay. Uh, we didn't get to do that last week because we didn't have our uh, Torah study. Uh, uh, but the last uh, Torah portion was Exodus 38, 21 to 40, 38. And after the Israelites cons constructed the sanctuary in the desert, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, Moses ordered that a reckoning be made of all the building materials used and account of everything that, that was going to be used. Um, I had quite a bit of, of notes on this, you know, but, uh, you know, just to discuss uh, why would the most humble man, the most righteous man in, in, in all of uh, Torah uh, have to make a reckoning, you know, 
uh, you know, and there's different thoughts on that. You know, the the people, you know, they wanted to know, you know, uh, where where was all the basically all the money, where was it going? But but so on. But Moses ordered an account to be made of all the donations given for uh, for the the tabernacle for the making of the tabernacle and how how they were used. All the gold and silver was accounted for to the very ounce. Okay, uh, but then we reach the end of this Torah portion. Uh, you know, the priestly garments are made. Uh, you know, Moses finally erects the tabernacle, and then that's a story in itself because nobody there was able to build it, and yet he was able to, according to the rabbi, put it all up on his own. So, uh, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say on his own. The Lord helped them. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, now the the tabernacle is filled with its glory, and, uh, and and you know, and if you are if you are an accountant, I think uh, someone like Deanna would have loved this chapter because uh, <laughs> uh, the the word uh, uh, "pekadu" means reckoning. Okay. And it refers to the telling, uh, the, 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 the getting all the sums of all the gold, the silver, the brass donated to the sanctuary. It was going through and telling everybody how everything was being used. But we have reached the conclusion, when we have reached the conclusion of a book in the Torah, it is, a, it is customary that when the Torah reader concludes a book of the Torah. The entire congregation exclaims, or Hesak, uh, Hesak, Vienet, Hesik, Vienet, Hesik, Vienet, Vienet, Hasak, Hesak, Hesak, Vienet, Hasak. Okay. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Okay. Now, this is taken from an article by Rabbi David Levy. Hesak. Be of strength. We encounter challenges, obstacles, and pressures in our life. He says to be strong, we need to take on all these challenges with the strength uh, our God has given us. Uh, we being rooted in God's word, his Torah. He goes on to say, it gives us the strength so we can be strong to meet whatever uh, tries to take us down. We are in the month of Adar and Purim is right around the corner. In the book of Esther, both Mordecai and Esther were strong, Hesach. Uh, they took on the challenges that they faced and defeated the enemy of their day. Okay. Uh, also, Rabbi David Levy uh, says be, the... It, it brings us to the second hasak. This points to the relationships. We are strong when we have people we can count on or rely on. Our family, our, our church, you know, uh, our uh, friends, uh, you know, many of us in our church family or our congregation, uh, <clears throat> you know, one thing I know about me, I see more of you more often than I do my immediate family. And I've got a lot of brothers and sisters, okay? Uh, so, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm happy about it because when I, I really feel good when I'm here with, with all my brothers and sisters here. Uh, so our families can make us strong. Our spiritual family our, our, and even our uh, blood relatives. Finally, Venesak, Venesak, we must strengthen each other. We are strengthened through what we have in common. And what do we have in common? We have God and his Torah. Okay, so I would like to uh, move on to uh, Vayikra. But before that, uh, join me in the traditional uh, proclamation, ending one book in Torah and beginning a new book in Torah. So all together, Hesak, Hesak, Benesh, Hesak, be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. It's funny, when I got here today, uh, 
Tila was telling me, she says, I saw this and I was wondering why didn't we do it or why, you know, and so she noticed it was on our notes and she thought, great, <laughs> great. I just felt that it's something that we need to do every time we get to the end of one of our books. So it's, it, it's all, it's, it's a tradition in the Jewish community. Um, it should be, it, it's also a tradition in the Messianic community. Okay. All right. Now we are in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And later on, we'll get to Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, this book uh, containing laws relating to the priests and the Levites and to the forms of Jewish ceremonial observances. Okay, that's where we're at. And this is from the dictionary. So, and it says in Hebrew, the name of the third book, Vayikra, in Hebrew, the book of Leviticus, you know, it's the opening words of this, uh, this uh, portion. Vayikra meaning, and he called. And that is Roman numeral one. Vayikra, and he called. Here God calls out to Moses. Do any of you, when you write something like that, like, and he called, do you put a cap? till h i do too it's just automatic yeah yeah you know it's just like no i i do capital h you can capital e that's fine too because it's it's you know yeah anytime i do like if it says his whatever but it's referring to the lord i always you know use the, the capital letter so uh Oh, go ahead, Maria. Usually, are you talking about when we write the word Lord and God? Anything that refers to our Lord. He. Oh, yeah. I kept, yeah. When you write God, you just write GD no. and Lord L I D. Yeah, but the reason I say that sometimes uh, you might be in the middle of a sentence. And you're speaking of, uh, of, the, of the Lord, of God, with a pronoun. But right in the middle of a sentence, if you have spell check, like many of us do on our computers, it right away, the capital H, it turns it to a small H. Then you got to go back in and change it. This is what I want, computer. You know? <laughs> don't, don't change it. You know? <laughs> but, but yeah, so it's, and he called. Here God yeah no no did you want to explain the small olive uh, then i'm not i'm going to go i'm going to move on <laughs> okay here god calls out to moses transmitting a set of instructions for what will be the sacrificial system of the temple this parasha begins in Leviticus 1, 1, and it's going to go to Leviticus 5, 26. There's a lot there. You know, uh, when we did the three-year uh, uh, Torah uh, portion, uh, I remember uh, there was a couple times there where the Torah portion was basically one or two paragraphs, and that was it. That was the whole Torah portion, you know. When we do it, uh, the one-year cycle, well, then we get a lot of chapters put in together. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the month of Adar, uh, or when it's a leap year, then there's, uh, there's four parashahs that are combined, but during, but during a leap year, they're separated. And we just uh, passed that on the last two books of Exodus. But uh, here, I'll just go on, you guys. So in uh, letter A, God calls Moses in the presence of the entire nation. So presence is the fill-in. Moses has anointed the tent of meeting and the priests who will, be, who will officiate it uh, in it. A cloud now covers the tent of meeting and the presence of the Lord fills the tabernacle. In this Torah portion, uh, God describes the laws of animal sacrifice. 
God explains the different sacrifices that atone for guilt or sins and distinguishes between sins committed inadvertently and sins committed on purpose. Okay. The tribe of Levi was set apart as priests, or you could say they were overseers or caretakers uh, of the tabernacle. But only the descendants of Aaron would officiate in the tabernacle. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, doing it God's way. You know, in, in the book of Numbers, we'll run across two of his sons that didn't do it his way and, and the outcome for not doing it his way. Okay, so uh, the other Levites, and there are other uh, Levites. Okay, so the other Levites would guard and they would also move uh, about, move the tabernacle about in the wilderness when they had to lift it up and, and, and move on. Uh, also, you know that, that the choirs were Levites. Okay, the, uh, the choirs in King David's time were Levites. An article related to the Midrash says that the Levites should serve at the sanctuary to be gatekeepers and singers over the offerings every day. And it says in Numbers 18.23, and the Levite, he shall do the service of the tent of meeting. And that's in Numbers 18.23. Uh, in the language of the Midrash, uh, <clears throat> uh, it says, I might understand that if he wishes, he might serve. And if he did not wish, to, he need not serve. In other words, this matter is a, uh, is a Levite that the Levite had a choice to serve or not to serve. It reminds me of uh, redemption of the firstborn. You know, if, uh, if you uh, have a child and you want to redeem them, uh, you can do it because the firstborn is to serve the Lord. Uh, so you know, I just, you know, but then I'll tell you, then uh, there's another thought on that where the rabbis say that no, every Levite was, uh, was supposed to serve the Lord, regardless, they had no choice on it. Pastor Bruce? We, we have an example of that in the Brit uh, John the Baptist was a Levite. Yeah. And he was not serving in the temple, he served outside. And uh, of course, Yeshua never uh, rebuked him for that or anything. Yeah. So that that might fall into this kind of a category. And you know, a lot, there's a lot of uh, uh, children that they grow up and they uh, they take on everything that their parents. Their parent teaches them the trade, and they continue in in that trade. You know, with uh, you know, with uh, John, John the Baptist with his mother and father being Levites, you know, I would, you know, he's going to be a priest in the temple, but you're absolutely right. You know, he, he was not a priest in the temple. And if he had tried to be a priest in this temple, you know, I really feel that he would, you know, with Herod at the time when Herod wanted to find out uh, everything, he, he would have been, he would have been uh, killed. He had to go out into the wilderness, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother uh, midrash. Saga. Huh? Saga. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Maria. It says that uh, Aaron will be a priest forever. Yes. And that, pri uh, that priesthood will stand forever. Yeshua is from the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Are they allowed to do temple sacrifices? Just like the no, I I with what I read in uh, in uh, Leviticus or in Torah, I don't think so. I I think that it's only going to be done uh, by the Levitical priesthood. Now, how are they going to work together? I don't know. Because but I always I, hear uh, Yeshua is going into the holy of holies. Yeah. And he's doing all these things that only a Levite priest can do. So I was wondering if that's clashing. No, I don't think they're going to clash. I think they're going to work together. But uh, but if you go into the 
you know, like a, a Christian pastor would probably tell you that uh, this has all been done away with. Isn't it amazing if, if it's all been done away with, why doesn't the Christian Bible only that thick? Yeah. Because you would have to throw away about two thirds of the Bible if it's been done away with. It's been done away with, but we can all go into the Holy of Holies, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> At any time. Yep. Yep. Okay, Pastor Bruce. Uh, it's an interesting principle that uh, when God makes a covenant, he never uh, does away with that, that covenant. Yeah. He adds the new covenant on top. Yeah. And so the old covenant is not negated. Uh, it's just uh, put into a, a, a different uh, place or a, right. a slot. Right. So it's important to remember that. So I think you're absolutely right. I think the two priests are going to be working in tandem. We yes. really don't understand how that all functions. Yeah. yeah. So does Yeshua go into the Holy of Holies now? <clears throat> well, there is no Holy of Holies in heaven now. There is no temple there. Sitting see, seated at the right hand of uh, unless you spiritualize it, then yeah. you got the throne of God would be the holy of holies, obviously. Yeah, yeah. he's at the right hand of that. Yeah, but um, these are things that we really just don't know. Yeah, yeah. Use your that microphone. Oh, yeah, they can't hear you. And my, uh, and you gotta turn your microphone on. <laughs> No, hold it close. <laughs> okay, like this? <laughs> Pastor Bruce is back, everybody. In Daniel, where it says unto 2,300 uh, years, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. What is that? I don't know. According to the Adventists, that already happened, 1844. October 22. Well, there you have it. 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> okay, you guys. So was it uh, likewise explained in chapter two? Okay, because it was also explained about the, about the Levites. Uh, it says in, uh, in the chap, well, in, in the Midrash, it says, that oral music was never to be uttered by anyone other than a Levite. This precept was reiterated in different uh, phrasing in the, in the Torah, for it, for it stated that, and he shall minister in the house of the Lord his God. And that's in Deuteronomy 18.7. So in the Midrash, uh, you know, it says, what is a ministry that is in the name of the Lord. We can put, we, we can, but say it's a, a song. Korah's son sang in the courts of, the, of God's house. Korah was a Levite, you know, granted he wasn't happy with the, with the job he was given. Uh, he wanted more, uh, but he wanted, the more that he wanted is he wanted to push somebody aside which both which was moses and aaron so he can take over uh it didn't happen so uh you know then rabbi uh Asi, a late third century rabbi said why do the small children uh he was asked well why do the small children begin or to learn with leviticus uh and not with genesis and you know and i I used to wonder that too, just because, you know, if you're going to read a, a book from cover to cover, that's what you do. You start at the beginning and, and you get started. But here, uh, they don't start in Genesis. The children start in, uh, in Leviticus. Uh, and he's, his answer was, because the small children are pure and the sacrifices are pure. So the pure come to occupy themselves with the pure. Uh, this has been a long tradition that Jewish children begin uh, studying Torah at a young age, and they begin with the book of Leviticus. But then on the other hand, I don't know if you ever heard of Jor Gordon J. Winham. He's a present day scholar. Well, from the, I think he, his first book he wrote in about the 1960s. Um, 
but what he says, uh, he says uh, present, uh, he says in Levit Leviticus, he says Leviticus used to be the first book that, that the Jewish children studied in the synagogue. He didn't go on to say what, how they study now, but that's what he said, that it used to be that way. I think when David Rubin uh, uh, visits us next month, I'm going to ask him if this is still the practice there, because they do teach the children there at, at the school uh, the books of the Bible. In fact, we were in a, uh, maybe, a, I don't know if it was a sixth grade class or fifth grade class, and uh, they were... Uh, they were all singing the book of Joshua. And I was, and I asked them, I said, well, why are they singing the, I mean, why Joshua, you know, uh, do they, you know, start in Torah? And he says, oh, they've already memorized those. They've already memorized the first five books. <laughs> and oh my gosh. And this was like, and they were young, they were young children. So, <clears throat> okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, in letter B, Moses is given instructions regarding the sacrifices, okay? There's five principal sacrifices and offerings uh, that were essential to the tabernacle and the temple worship, and that's what we have here in uh, this parashah. The Jewish religion absolutely forbids human sacrifices. Normally, the animal sacrifices were made in front of the tabernacle, in the front of the tent of meeting. <clears throat> the sacrifices were domestic animals and were without blemish and not less than eight days old and not older than three years old. So I guess when an animal got to the age of three and a day after, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Whew. Then, then you're right. <laughs> Let's have a feast. <laughs> yeah, it was no less than eight days old and not older than three years old. That's, yeah, uh, that's what the Midrash said. No, you know, that they would go up to three years old. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria. I, I heard that it. It only went to a year because at after a year they start getting sexual feeling, mm. and that does not apply to the Messiah. You know uh, that that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Just the fact that you know they're they're older and uh, they can be uh, gored or whatever. Uh, you know uh, anything can happen to them, and they, they they would have a blemish on them. So. That, that's that's good, Maria. I'm glad you're here, Maria. <laughs> I, I'm glad you're here, Maria. Now somebody hide the microphone. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, the offer the offerer, the person giving the sacrifice, uh, would have to purify himself. You know, we we've talked about this before about the the mikvahs that we have out there. But here out in the desert, the mikvah was the, the basin, the water basin, or, or in a, before they would even come in for an offering, they would have to be clean too, okay? Uh, not only the, the offering, you know, the, the priest, people serving there, but also the people bringing the, the offering to the tent of meeting, okay? Uh, or just outside of it. And, uh, and then he would lay his hands on, on the head, and that's in Leviticus 1.4, okay? And the words for to lay the hands on has the idea of leaning or resting by supporting oneself on the animal. They would put their full weight on the, on the animal, uh, you know, heavily, you know, with their hands. The offerer was personally involved in the slain, the skinning and the preparing and preparing the sacrifice. So I would wonder, I wonder how many women did this. You know, the, the priest performed the ritual in the sacrifice. You no, know, the reason I say that is because 
if you're remember you're going to be involved with 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 everything i know with with uh peggy she would tell me no you go do it you know <laughs> so <laughs> so um and then there's the word korban korban and letter c uh the fill in there is korban k-o-r-b-a-n and that means to draw near it's brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then I might as well give you a letter D. Five kinds of sacrifices, offerings brought to the tabernacle. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the burnt offering. Leviticus 1, 3 through 17. And that's Olah. O-L-A-H, okay, and uh, Ola, not, not Ola, not hello, but <laughs> Ola is that which goes up, and it's probably referring to the smoke of the totally consumed sacrifice, because this sacrifice is totally consumed, and, uh, and the smoke would go straight up. If you think about our picture in our uh, sanctuary, uh, it, and the smoke is going straight up. And the rabbis say that even on a windy day, it didn't matter if there was 30, 40 mile an hour winds, when they did the sacrifices, the smoke always went straight up. Okay, that's at, well, that's at the temple, but that also was in the wilderness. Yeah, probably a more reliable source would be uh, Josephus. Josephus yeah. writes that the smoke never varied; it always went straight. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. the rabbis like to embellish their stories a little. Yes. So, and Josephus also told us there was never once any bugs found on the Temple Mount, which is amazing with the smell of all that blood. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't go through the mikvah. <laughs> they weren't allowed up there. Boy, and then how? Yeah, she is. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> what about your, um, the city, Jerusalem? Was it uh, clean? Because I heard uh, a pastor say that the streets were so filthy that it was smelly and full of manure and all sorts of trash and i thought well that didn't seem right because the jews were always so particular about wh where they walked and what they stepped on especially near the temple you know what i didn't do you guys i didn't get me the microphone so well the cities uh, of course do get dirty but uh, if i recall properly no chickens were allowed to live inside the city limits so Jerusalem, right? Because they're so filthy, dirty, right? Um, but the city itself, I'm sure, I don't think you would have wanted to eat off the, the uh, street. Was it stinky? I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But you got books. I can tell you today. Today, when yeah. When you go into old the old city of Jerusalem, it's divided into four quarters, and the Christian, Armenian, and Arab quarters are filthy, dirty. Right. Filthy. The, the, I mean, we don't even hang out in those three quarters. We just walk through them. We walk through them to get to the Jewish quarter. The Jewish quarter is spotless. Nice. Spotless. Yep. You see, and I was going to share that. That. Uh, yeah. I was going to share that because we went walking through the the Muslim quarter of, of the old city. And, but we, you have to go through there. It's like a shortcut. If you don't go that way, you're going to be going all the way around, which is probably a, a mile walk at least. But so we walked right through it and it was, it was very filthy and we didn't stop. We didn't stop at any of the gift shops or anything. We just wanted to get through it. And then we get over to the, to the Jewish quarter and it was like night and day oh my gosh it was you know it was filthy dark you get into the jewish quarters and it was 
sunshine, light. It was, and everything. It's like somebody went through and just mopped the the stones and cleaned it up. It was it was that it was that clean. So it's uh, it's 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 totally different. And that's today. You know, back then, I would imagine if if uh, you know if the Lord left, if the Lord lifted up and says, "Hey, I'm not gonna." stay here any longer when did he say that no i'm just saying if he did if if he did well we figure the temples were destroyed and in the second temple uh, it didn't have the glory of the first one the first temple may have been much smaller and uh not as extravagant as the king herod's but king herod's never had the glory that the first temple had so the glory of uh, of the lord resting upon it the lord was still in the second temple. oh he may have been there yeah but... was in the temple. yeah he was was he in the temple i mean inside the the holy of holies yeah, yeah. so oh we know that we know that but i'm just saying that uh you know his his presence didn't lie on the second temple as it did in the first temple or the Mishkan in the in the wilderness. Yes, they say that. Yeah. Well, in the word, Josephus, Josephus again tells us there was no Ark of the Covenant. It was gone already. The high priest was uh, not in the right order of things. Uh, in fact, there was two high priests during the Lord's days. One of them wasn't even Jewish. Um, he was an Edom, Edomite, it was the king. Uh, we know that James, the brother of the Lord, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies to pray mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Well, so, what about the cloud that was sent there? Well, there was some see. glory there because Josephus writes yeah. about the, the pillar, the, the smoke going straight up. So it seems that the longer mankind goes, the further we get from God, the further we get from God, the less anointing there is. It, it, it's just simple math. And this is why we have to return uh, to the, to the, the right. days of old is, is to retrieve that anointing because it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. it, it, God has lifted his presence because we are we don't realize how far off we are. Right. We are so far out there. I mean, it's it's a miracle we can even get saved at this point. You know, and and it, even now, you know, like I was, uh, you know, exalting you guys, saying that boy, we're, you know, at least we're in Leviticus because there's going to be there's some congregations that don't even get into this book. But we are reading it. But what? How far into it have we gone? Are we? We're probably just ba ba really scraping the surface. You know, there's probably so much more there to learn. You know, I just wanted to share. I don't have Peggy here today, you guys. So if somebody out there in uh, zooming in would like to share, uh, just do the the hand, and then we'll 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 get a hold of you. Okay, I do have a Sue that's watching it. So. Okay, so we talked about the offering. Uh, like I said, it's probably with, with the smoke going up. Uh, uh, it says that it consisted of a male animal, of the cattle, the sheep, or the fowl, and was entirely consumed, except for the hide by the, by the altar fire. The skin was given to the priest, and the blood of the sacrifice was, spink, it was sprinkled around the altar. Uh, the daily offering was made for the nations and for the individuals to secure atonement. And that's in verse four. Okay. A guilt or sin offering often preceded it. Okay. Uh, the idea of the burnt offering symbolizes a self surrender of the whole person to the Lord because of his personal sin. It was necessary for the individual to die spiritually. There was no reservation since the sacrifice was yielded to the Lord on behalf of the individual. So uh, in, in Roman numeral two, 
burnt offering. Animal had to be ritually clean, unblemished. Okay, and and that's you know that's we're talking about the the temple there, Maria. Even in the on the temple, even if the person had some kind of uh, if he was if, you know if he couldn't speak or whatever, he had a blemish on him. He was not allowed to serve on the temple. See, you know, so everything the Lord he wants perfect up on the temple and in the second temple you know it's amazing with uh, so much that went on you know with all the stuff that wasn't perfect going on you know but he still allowed his presence to be shown there i just don't feel that it was the same presence that was in the wilderness and then after the wilderness into the first temple uh I think it just gradually, yeah, you know, imagine uh, the people that were walking in the desert with the glory of the Lord uh, with them, how amazing that was. And then what did the people do? They complained, you know, so it's, uh, you, we would, and you know, we would think ourselves, boy, if I was there, I wouldn't have complained. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> if I can't have my in and out burger, I mean. <laughs> Why do we bring all this gold along anyway? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and I was going to share that in last week's parish shop. I was going to do it. You know, I, I think uh, Ray uh, Gottenboss, he had a real good comment that one, when he was here the week before that, when he said, I think the people were happy to get rid of all that gold, silver, and brass. He said, when you're talking about, you know, like, like uh, 20,000 pounds of metal carrying it through the desert, here, take it. <laughs> and then the Levites, they probably said, no more, they've given us enough because they already knew they're going to have to carry it. <laughs> Not a... <laughs> so... But uh, okay, the daily offering, like it was, uh, was made for the nation. A guilt and sin offering, like I said, would uh, uh, often preceded it. Okay, uh, Yeshua came to do the will of the Father. Okay, what a greater demonstration of that fact that we, you know that we can find that in totally consumed offering of Himself on the cross. You know, Yeshua said. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that's in John 6, 38. Okay. He came to bring completion uh, the, you know, of the work. He was, com he was completely dedicated to the will of God. And, and he prayed, not my will, thy will be done. It totally consumed him. He set his face towards the cross and didn't and I, I said he did not waver but uh yeah he tried to, <laughs> to get out of it but then when he realized you know your will not my will um uh, you know it, he was he was all in so pastor bruce i think the only reason the cross worked is because the lord was totally consumed prior to the cross yeah yeah think about that yeah yeah. You know, that's why his death was able to do and affect what it did. I'm in. Because he was in. totally consumed yes. yeah. before yep. that. Yep. Yep. And that's why I put down he was he was all in. All the animal sacrifices that we're going to cover today point to the death of Yeshua. They all point point to Yeshua. One thing I like. Uh, did I give you letter A in Roman numeral two? No. Ola means going up, completely burned at the altar. Burned on the altar. And then in letter B, uh, burnt offering was a free will gesture. You know, I think that's exactly what the Lord wants from us. He wants us, you know our own free will, you know, how much, how much uh, uh, would the Lord desire our sacrifices 
if uh, you know somebody put our arm behind our back and said you're going to do it this way and you know it's uh, no he just wants us to here here lord uh, take it take all of it or take me father do as you will you know your will be done um uh, <clears throat> hebrews chapter 10 places the emphasis on one uh, sufficient sacrifice of our messiah uh to atone for sin uh, by this will, we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Yeshua once and for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifice or the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But he having offered one sacrifice for sin, sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And that's in Hebrews 10, 10 to 12. If there is a, uh, a book in uh, the Breed Hadashah that really relates to the book of Leviticus, it's the book of Hebrews. So a lot of you students here that are, uh, that are uh, listening or, or, or zooming in with Pastor Paul in the book of uh, Hebrews, you're, you're getting a, a, a whole lot there. There's a lot of understanding there. Um, this was a once and for all sacrifice, uh, never to be repeated like the animal sacrifices that could only point to and teach about the coming of the perfect sacrifice for sin. They couldn't make any per one perfect in the sight of God. And that's in uh, 10, 1 to, to 3 in uh, Hebrews. Every sacrifice was a constant reminder of the sins of the people. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And that was in verse 4. However, for, one, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are uh, sanctified. So Yeshua, just once and for all, he took care of everything. You know, and later on, I'm going to hit on something that that's very important to, to understand because uh, this, these are the things that we discuss here, uh, you know, in the Midrash, but as a Christian. Messiah Yeshua came and paid our sin debt in full. Every believer is covered by his sacrifice. And when you read uh, Hebrews, um, that's, that's the point that, that, they get to, and then you wonder why. Well, then why are we in Leviticus? There's something important here that we have to uncover. We need to con continue to study Leviticus because Levi uh, Leviticus didn't go away. Okay, uh, so the burnt offering with either cattle, goats, sheep, or doves, depending on a person's means. If a person were poor, they would bring a dove. If they had some type of wealth, they would bring a much larger animal. And like I said earlier, how serious would a person be about their offering if uh, they had the means to bring a larger animal, but they didn't? They brought a, a dove. You know, the Lord knows. You might be able to fool the person next to you, but you're not going to fool the Lord, you know like Cain, the offering would not have been accepted. Go ahead, Maria, use a microphone. Yeshua came to take away the sins or the sin, sin. nature. The sin nature. So the sins remain. Well, we, we're, we still, <laughs> yeah, John 1.9. Got the pastor on line one. Yeah, he's given us the ability to deal with our daily sins through First John one nine. The, the people of Israel did that with the daily sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They dealt with their sin. The yearly sacrifice dealt with the condition of the nation for the next year. That's more. Yeah, that's more comparable to the the sin nature. Now, Hebrews comes along and tells us later that the second covenant is a better covenant. Why? Well, because it's done one time. Uh, you have to confess your sins daily. 
And that has to do not with salvation, not with the dealing of your sins, but with your relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Your, uh, you know, uh, so you can walk with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very important that to uh, these things are a picture of what's to come. And now it's a better sacrifice because we don't have to do it. For one thing, we don't have to do Yom Kippur sacrifice every year. And, and secondly, you don't have to remember the children of Israel, even to sacrifice a daily sacrifice, couldn't do it in Bethlehem. They had to go to the Temple Mount to do it. Right. So it was a big production yep. to, to drive these animals up to Jerusalem and then spend time there and prepare yourself, prepare your heart, and then, and then sacrifice the animal and go home. Right. Uh, that's a chunk of ch time. So yep. now we can do it at home. We can do it whenever. You can do it sitting on the freeway. First John 1, 9 is such an important scripture. I think it's highly overlooked by the church. I personally feel it's one of the single most important scriptures in the word of God. Go ahead, Tila. I just want to ask, um, because I think are they still gonna do aren't they still gonna do the sacrifices in the millennium? Yes. Okay, so how does that work with you know, Yeshua and doing are they gonna be animal sacrifices? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that's how I'm gonna end this Torah portion. But uh, but but you're right, you know, after everything that goes on here. And we're like I said, we're going to get through, uh, you know, some of the scriptures in Hebrew of Yeshua once and for all. Right. But you're absolutely right. You know, there are five prophets mm -hmm. that uh, they tell us that there will be animal sacrifices in the millennial uh, temple, the mill millennial reign. So uh, how do we how do we bring that all together? You know, there's uh, a lot of Christian pastors that have, uh, you know, and then, and, you know, and then what they, you know, but the one thing I just don't like hearing is, oh, we, that's been done away with, yeah, yeah, you know, and that's what you hear. That's been done away with. It hasn't been done away with. If uh, Genesis to Revelation is the word of God, then we are reading the word right now as we're going through Leviticus. Go ahead, Maria. When I was studying this, it says that we misuse the word sacrifice, that we should not use it because when we say sacrifice, we think right away of killing an animal. Mm -hmm. We should use the word koban, which means whenever we draw offer near. an animal is to draw near to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and there's many things that we can draw near to the Lord with with our praises, our, our worship. We could draw near uh, with, with our offerings, you know, our, our, our tithes, our, you know, we're all, we're, we're, we're drawing near. You, you know, it's, it's like giving something and not expecting anything uh, in return, like, like monetary, hey, I gave you 10 bucks the next week, I want you to give me 20, you know. Just be faithful in what you give, the Lord will bless you. You know, I think, uh, and a lot of times too, uh, I remember a person years ago in this congregation gave a, a, a good lump of uh, money. And I remember about six months later, he said, well, you know, six months ago, I gave this much money. I still haven't seen any of a return on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if it's, <laughs> I mean, was his heart right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, so, Okay, in letter C of Roman numeral two, the burnt offering symbolizes a complete and total surrender to God. Complete and surrender are the fillings. Okay, we're going to move right on to the grain offering, the mitcha uh, offering. It consisted of fine flour. And if you're like me, I put flour, F-L-O-W-E-R. So. <laughs> I was going to say, at you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night with the little baby there with me. 
<laughs> but it consisted of fine flour, F-L-O-U-R, baked goods or grain from corn, and that's Leviticus 2, 4, 5, 7, and 14. Okay, the fine flour was mixed with oil and incense. Now, mixed with incense, can you see, uh, you know, a, a soothing aroma going up to, to the Lord? But because the only difference between the daily meal and the offering was the addition of the incense. The grain offering was a constant reminder to the people of Israel that God gave them their food, and they in turn owed, owed him their lives. Their, in other words, they owed the Lord their obedience. You know, uh, their economy, their livelihood uh, depended on agriculture. So, uh, you know, the, that one thing I want you to know that the pagan uh, Canaanites, they worship Baal, but they, they relied on, uh, on giving sacrifices to, to Baal, their God, because they wanted a uh, you know, good crop too. But the only thing is, what they offered was human sacrifices, you know, something that, that the Lord would not accept, okay? However, God reminded his people that he was sovereign over the environment. A handful of the fine flour and oil was burned on the altar, okay? In Roman numeral three, grain offering made from fine flour. It was a sweet fragrance to the Lord, okay? And this was, when you did this offering, it was like saying, uh, thank you. Thank you for all that, that, you, that I have received in my life, okay? The rest of the grain offering was given to the priest for the food, okay? Uh, some of this offering was also given to the priest. Um, this was part of God's provision for the priest, as they served the Lord. Uh, the leftovers were also part of the fellowship meal of the worship of the of the person who was offering it and his family. Uh, the variety in the offering made uh, it possible for all uh, worshipers, regardless of rich or poor or in between, to bring an offering of thanksgiving to God. This was a type of offering. The first one we talked about, you could bring was it uh, uh, some, uh, an animal from the flock. This one was grain. Everybody could bring grain, even those that were very poor. What do we read later on, even when we read about Ruth and, uh, you know, they would also leave things on the ground on purpose. So the people that are in need can just come by and pick it up. So a grain offering you always, you know, you can always bring a grain offering, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this offering signified thanksgiving to God for their daily bread. The Lord provided their crops and flocks, not Baal, okay? It was offered in relation to the blood offerings and usually followed the burnt offering. You usually had the burnt offering and then the grain offering. The grain offering will show the perfect life that Yeshua lived in obedience to the Father. There are, there are scriptures that relate directly to this gr grain offering. Yeshua said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Then he goes on to say, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's in John 12, 23, 24. Okay, Yeshua looked beyond his death to his glory that would follow. The wheat falls into the ground and dies, but it comes alive again as a sprout and bears much fruit. Yeshua was reminding his disciples that he would die and he would rise again. Uh, Yeshua died as our substitute. And that's in Corinthians 5.21 and Romans 5.6-8. through 8. The death and resurrection of Yeshua 
was a sweet, was a sweet smelling aroma to the father. It was an it was the aroma of obedience. Okay, Yeshua told his disciples, "My food is to do the will of Him who sent me to accomplish His work." That's in John four thirty four. Go ahead, Tila. I just had a question in verse eleven. It says in, in two eleven. It says, "No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire." I was just wondering why the is there a reason why we can't use the honey? You know, I mean, he, sweet. He, I mean, it is sweet, but I think that's a substitute. He wants uh, the incense. Um, yeah, you know, and it's just like when I, I go get the uh, challah bread, I like it when, uh, you know, they don't do it all the time, but you have to request it. And I ask them if they can make it with honey, you know, because it's, it's like you said, yeah, it says not to, but that's for this offering, but you're right. That's not for the holler, you know, but, uh, but, but I do that every now and then if I could get there on time, I, if I do it over the phone, um, they say, oh, okay. And then it never gets done. Yeah. In fact, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I order the holler bread and I go there and the, go there to pick it up. And they never made it. Yeah. So that's happened a few times. So I thought, eh, you know, so they always apologize. Well, I mean, what could you say, you know, but yeah, <laughs> but this will work, you know, and, and I'll say, well, uh, you know, it's going to have to, you know, so that's why every now and then sometimes I don't know if, uh, if uh, Felicia has noticed, sometimes I bring in a different type of bread. <laughs> Most, in fact, I think I, the one I brought this time had seed in it, right? Yeah. That's because they did not make my challah bread. <laughs> so I went over to the counter there and I picked up whatever they had. So, but, uh, <clears throat> but he said, uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. To those who are perishing without uh, the salvation through our Messiah, it is the stench and death and eternal punishment. Because you think about the opposite. Okay, if it's a sweet aroma to the Lord, you know, if you don't have, if you didn't accept salvation, well, you know, it's probably sickening to the Lord. You know, there is nothing so sweet, pure, and wonderful as the sweet smell of Yeshua in our life. Amen. Amen. The grain offering is a picture of the believer in the Lord who has been justifi justified through Yeshua. Okay. In uh, Roman numeral 3a, mincha uh, means gift or tribute. It's a gift offering. And then in letter B, it's also a free will offering. Had no leaven in it. This, this grain offering. That would be like uh, matzah. Okay. We receive our spiritual nourishment, our daily bread from Yeshua. And it's a privilege uh, to offer back to him a portion of what... Uh, he has, you know, given to us. And, I, and we do that probably every Shabbat. We give something back to the Lord. We are, we are so, so blessed. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, and, you know, it doesn't bother me at all when we take these special offerings because, uh, you know, being a family, um, there are people in need and we take special offerings, you know, sadaka or whatever it may be. Uh, and, you know, to me, it's, it's a way of just saying, you know, thank you, Lord, you've given me so much. Here's a portion coming back to you. Uh, back in these, in this time, it was an agricultural uh, society. You know, today, uh, we more, it's more like money. Okay. So we offer back up to him a small gift that says, thank you. Okay. These uh, sacrifices are also to say thank you. Lastly, the grain offering must be salted. 
We covered this a little bit earlier. We are told here in chapter 213 of Leviticus uh, about the salt. You must add salt to it. Salt is a preservative. The salt of the covenant. God's faithfulness is seen here with the salt. Uh, uh, to this day, there is salt on the Shabbat table, and we dip our bread in the salt. And we've been doing that from the get-go. Been, they've been doing it for thousands of years, and it's uh, continuing. It's a reminder of the covenant that the Lord has with us, okay? And as uh, Pastor Bruce uh, said earlier, you know, his covenants never, never go away. We might add, it might be added to, but the covenant never goes away. I think one of the greatest covenants is, uh, and there's a couple of them, Abraham, I will make you a great nation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you won't even be able to number your, your descendants. And then in, how about Noah with the rainbow, a reminder, and it's a reminder to us to this day, the covenant never went away. Mm -hmm. So, Pastor Bruce? Yeah, it, it's the covenants are the word of God. It's God speaking to his people, and the word of God never goes away. Yeah. Amen. So, so whenever you're looking at or examining a covenant and it seems to be have been replaced, that's wrong. It has not been replaced. It may be covered over right now on a different layer. But it's still up to us to seek for it and find it and find out what is valuable in it for us. Yes. Yeah, Amen. The whole world yeah. is his covenant. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love this. But uh, and then then we get to chapter three, everyone. And now it's the peace offering that is that is taken by the people to the tabernacle. The peace offering, or uh, zebak, uh, is also called the fellowship offering. It is literally a sacrifice of happiness. Can you be happy? Yes. <laughs> In Roman numeral four, peace offering, like the previous two, this was voluntary. You know, and I would imagine, I mean, we... we we want to bring our sacrifices to him, voluntary, our, fr our free will offering, you know. So um, it consisted, this offering consisted of an ox, lamb or goat, male or female. The priest sprinkled the blood on the altar while the liver, kidney, and fat were burned on the altar. Why would he want the fat? That's because that was the most precious to him. The so the what? The ribeye. The ribeye. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was most precious to him. Um, uh, God claimed that this was the richest part of the, sac of, the, of the animal. The priest was given the breast and the right thigh. And then the person offering the sacrifice was, was allowed was to eat the remain. It is the only sacrifice which the people shared by eating a portion of the sacrifice. And that's in uh, seven, uh, in a, I put 715, but I know we're in, in chapter three. Okay. Uh, the peace offering was symbolic of the peace that already existed between the Israelites and, and God because of the atonement. Therefore, it was time to celebrate. It was never offered to obtain peace. And that's what a lot of people, peace offering, um, it's probably to obtain peace with the Lord. Nope, that isn't what it was there for. But it was, you know, it was a celebration uh, with what the Lord has done for his people, for, or for you in particular. It is a picture of the fellowship between God and the believing sinner based on the blood sacrifices. This offering uh, pictures the blessing and powers which salvation has secured in the death through Yeshua. It is a thanksgiving praise offering. 
this this is a this is a wonderful you see like i said earlier every offering is going to point to our our messiah yeshua is our shalom our peace now in messiah you who you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of yeshua for he himself is our peace our shalom who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. I just read from Ephesians chapter 2, 13 and 14. If you want to write it down. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Yeah, to your point, uh, the peace offering wasn't to obtain peace or make peace with God. But if we go back to the root meaning of the word shalom, mm -hmm. that means nothing missing, nothing broken. So it's a, it's Amen. a celebration. Amen. It's just, yeah. And then in letter A, Shalamin means shalom. This is a sh Shalamin offering. Well, it means shalom. Only the fat was burned on the altar. The rest was divided between the priest and the offerer. If that, is that a word? Offerer? Yeah. Okay. We'll go with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of like the flower, yeah. <laughs> the offeree. The there you go. Uh, so shal shalom and offeree would be the fill-in. Thank you, Gary. You could tell that English wasn't my major subject in school. You know, I sometimes I I admire some of these. Uh, people that went to school and they excelled in every subject. You know, it's just like our Molly. It seems like every time I would uh, speak with Molly or her grandma, or it was always, I mean, she excelled at everything, that young lady, you know? I mean, it's amazing. I've got a grandson that's the same way. That kid, you know, going to college and, and getting straight A's, it's like, oh my gosh. I said, you didn't take after me, you took after grandma, you know? <laughs> so so um, it's amazing, but, uh, you know, like I tell Peggy, my 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 spelling and everything has really improved quite a bit ever since I got out of school. <laughs> but uh, the penalty for our sins had been paid in full by Yeshua, by the death of Yeshua. With that, God declares us justified. Therefore, Yeshua is our peace. He has made peace for us through his death. We can now celebrate with thanksgiving for his peace offering to us. In Colossians 1, 9, Colossians 1, 19 to 20, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Amen. And then in Romans 5, 1, therefore, I have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. Romans 5, 1. You know, and it, it can go on. I only took a few out, okay? It is this. Not what the writer of Hebrews has in mind as he concludes his book with these words. In Hebrews uh, 13, 15, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of, of lips that give thanks to him. So uh, our, our Yeshua, you could see, he is our peace offering, okay? Uh, <clears throat> you know, we enjoy fellowship and peace with God and, our, uh, and, and each other because of the peace that has been established through the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua on our behalf, on your behalf. These peace offerings are always preceded by the daily burnt offering in the tabernacle uh, therefore, it was a thanksgiving offering for salvation completed. It was a time of joyful celebration and thanksgiving. Okay, now the next one we're going to go to in Roman numeral five is the sin offering. 
Disobedience is the fill-in. Disobedience to God required a sin offering. Is there anybody in this room that would be giving a sin offering? <laughs> Every day, exactly. And uh, it, you could, it could be spelled different ways. A sin offering or hata offering. Um, hat, in letter A, hata means to miss the mark. So when we sin, we have missed the mark. Falling short of the glory. Falling short. I don't know about you if you've ever had a bow and arrow and, <laughs> and try to hit that mark, you know. I think of that, uh, you know, shooting it and missing the mark and missing the mark and missing the mark. And he says, keep trying, <laughs> you know, keep doing it. The sin offering in Leviticus uh, chapter four, one, uh, it starts in chapter four, one, and really it goes all the way towards the end of the, of the parish show. It was an offering for the covering of sin. It could be an ox, a ram, a uh, kid, doves, pigeon, or even fine flour, depending on the nature of, of the case of the sin. This offering covered sins committed out of weakness or waywardness, unintentional sin. It did not cover the sin of, uh, of uh, purposely uh, you're in defiance of God or open sins of rebellion. Because we do get a lot of, there's a lot of sin like that. Uh, it did not deal with sins in general, but particular sins. In Numbers 15, uh, 30, 31, if you want to write this down, it reminds us that there was no offering accepted for the defiant person. Pastor Paul has uh, stated that, you know, repeatedly, uh, sometimes at these tourists, Torah studies, you know, about the person who sins on purpose, that there's no, uh, there's no sacrifice to bring for, for, for that type of sin. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, I mean, we can go on and on with uh, purpose, uh, or, or purpose sin, or, you know, I mean, because look at this dummy in uh, Russia, uh, you know, the atrocities that he, that he has caused. It's great that a lot of the, the nations have come up verbally against them and like that, but this guy is still a maniac and he's still out there trying to, you know, cause havoc and intentional. It's intentional. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's definitely on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, and I, I liked uh, when we prayed this Shabbat. You know, we have to continue to pray for for the people. You know, um, you know, I I pray that we send jets in or send aircraft in to uh, to uh, push you know Russia back. But you know, there's a lot of people, and I'm not saying boots on the ground. But if if, if that happens, I don't know. So be it. You know, but I know a lot of people, they don't want anything like that. Uh, but we have enough aircraft that we could, uh, yeah. we could help them. We could help uh, Ukraine. Okay. The people brought their animals to the tabernacle. And in the presence of the priest, he placed his hands on the head of the sacrifice, thus identifying himself with the sacrifice. And it, it was like that with, 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 most or almost all of the sacrifices. The animal was slain and the blood was sprinkled either on the horns of the great altar or in the holy place towards the veil. The fire on the brazen altar consumed the fat. In some instances, the flesh was given to the priest. Then th in this offering, unconsumed parts were burned outside the camp. Okay, the... And then, uh, <clears throat> and this was a sin offering. And letter B, 
A gift to say that you apologize for what you have done. I don't think it was that simple just saying, you know, I'm sorry, Lord, and then go back and do the same sin again. But this offering was, uh, was to say that, uh, you know, I apologize. I realize I blew it. Okay, so uh, the next offering is the guilt offering. The guilt offering, a psalm, was similar to the sin offering. The procedure and purpose was much the same. However, the guilt offering was a special kind of sin offering. Uh, restitution was in addition to the sacrifice of the animal. Uh, not only did the offeree have to make restitution, but he had to pay a penalty equal to a fifth part of the value. So he had to pay in full plus 20%. The person made a personal confession of specific sin that he had committed. And that's in chapter 5, uh, verse 5. <coughs> this knowledge brought about a deep sense of guilt and humiliation. Because of his personal knowledge of, this, of sin, he must obtain forgiveness and make restitution. So the guilt offering in Roman numeral six also requires restitution. You know, it's one thing to uh, to say you're to to give an offering, or uh, hey, I took twenty bucks. You know, uh, so and so, can you go back and uh, give the twenty dollars to this person? Don't tell them who was it that took it from them, but just give them this back mm -hmm. and. To think that uh, that made everything all right. The Lord here is saying, no, it's not all right. You have to go make restitution. You know, you've got to do it. I saw a real good Christian, uh, well, it was a movie, uh, Pure Flix. I don't know if any of you have Pure Flix. Yeah, we watched a, a movie on there where uh, the, the, the gal was, she was a runner. I don't know if you saw that. I forget what the name of it was. But uh, she was a, she was in uh, cross country and she ran. But uh, but before you know you get to the end, what happened is she just had this thing of taking things. Mm -hmm. She took a person's uh, you know a Walkman or whatever. She tells you how old the movie was. Took the person's Walkman <laughs> uh, and uh, she took a, a watch from uh, the person that was trying to help her in this. Well, when she finally came to the Lord, she had to go back to each and every person, and she did that. She just didn't leave it on the doorstep. What she did is she knocked on the door and say, here, you know, I took this from you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, it, didn't, it didn't do that. Maybe, well, she had it in a box, so maybe that box was the 20%. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, she paid, you know, uh, she brought everything back. You know, uh, if she paid restitution, that would be been good too. But, uh, but the thing, but the whole idea is, when you come to the Lord and you do a sacrifice, you on this one here, you have to do it. You don't send somebody in your place. You take care of it. If I did uh, Stephen wrong, then I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to apologize. You know, I apologize for what I did and, and, and make restitution and give them an extra 20 cents, you know, and <laughs> Here. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Yeshua's death on the cross was full in a fine, final sin offering. It was a final guilt offering. Okay. Um, our sinless savior took upon himself all our sins that we might have God's perfect righteousness. Go ahead, Maria. Does it matter what uh, sect I bring the animal? If it says uh, to bring a male, is it okay if I bring a female? Not, if, if it requires a, a male, it has to be male, okay? Why? Because that's what the word says. That's what the father. Mean. Yeah. Then why does the sin offering require male or female? No, requires a female. 
Oh yeah, that's the one with the female. You're right. Yeah, it would have to be a, a female. You know, I, and you're right. Why? <laughs> I didn't read that. <laughs> I mean, if they all have a meaning to it, why are we skipping over it? Well, you know what? And I'll tell you something. Like I said, every time we come to these parishas, that would be something that we can look up and discuss the next time we come here. You said that two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did I do this parish out two years ago? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'll tell you something. If, uh, if we are in a parish hall and uh, you would like an answer to a certain question, you know, write it down and give it to us because we will look it up and do our best to uh, mm -hmm. find find the answers for you and sometimes you're not going to like the answers because uh you know what is that old saying uh, uh two jews three opinions mm -hmm. that's exactly what we always run into is that or saying? huh no. that jewish. 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 jewish that's a jewish, a jewish? yeah but it's true of everyone yeah, and that is, that is. You've but never the, been in the Puerto Rican one, have you? <laughs> <laughs> if there, if it's any uh, similarity to uh, Mexican, yep, I've been there, done that. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. You know, I would suspect that this has something to do, not completely, but something to do with uh, the idea that it taps into the, the different emotional sides of God. Um, you know, the female being probably more given to a guilt offering, the, the right brain, uh, you know, and I'm just kind of speculating here. I'm, I'm just throwing some fodder out there, but, um, God is, he, he, in his personality, he has the whole mix, mm -hmm. uh, and we're divided into the little subsections of that mix. That's why we need one another to be whole. Uh, and so I would suspect that it has something to do with gender. I think Kathleen has something. Well, no, it, I was just, of course, I Google everything. <laughs> she says here, a female sheep is more valuable in the flock than a male one. That's one reason. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 No, that, that, was, that was real good. I... I liked uh, Kathleen's uh, description better than yours, Pastor Bruce. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Go ahead, Maria. The, the sin offering was very different from all the others because the others you just sprinkle uh -huh. on the side of the altar. With the sin offering, you smeared it on the horns and you took it inside the sanctuary and you sprinkled it on the veil right seven times and i was reading that can you imagine what that would look like if every day you sprinkled blood on the veil but the rabbis i guess it's the same two rabbis that have the three opinions say that <laughs> on the day of a of atonement miraculously it was cleaned yeah all by itself yeah. no i read that too where uh where it would be clean in fact that's in the midrash uh that, that it would be cleaned by itself but uh but you you need to understand that the sacrifices ended at three o'clock okay the last uh sacrifice would be yeah for the people but then after that there was still, remember, it's just like in today's uh, employment, uh, you know, not in all jobs, but uh, you had a night shift, you know, so you had, you had different shifts there. So you did have people that they would show up and they would do the cleaning. And like you said, but you can't go into the Holy of Holies and clean. It would have to be miraculously be cleansed by itself. But at least the out outside of the tabernacle, um they say that in fact when you go up to the temple mount even today they have like a like a trough or a funnel if you want to call a funnel that goes all the way to the end of the of the wall there and they would just water it all down and everything would just go out and they would get it spotless so the next day it was like 
they hadn't even had a sacrifice there. It was that clean again. Go ahead. Pastor Paul, Paul, unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, I just want to go back and touch on the Hatat offering, um, because if we realize that really it's made for purification and cleansing, because if you say that Yeshua fulfilled all of those, he did not apologize for sin. Mm -hmm. It's the cleansing that 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 sacrifice, that's what it accomplishes. When we did our study through Leviticus, we spent a lot of time on understanding that and bringing out that truth, because if it's supposed to coincide with Yeshua, uh, he did never apologize for sin. He provided the cleansing and the purification for sin. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else you, would you like to add? Well, I. <laughs> <laughs> we only. If you ask, Pastor, you know you. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Go ahead. It, this is this is really good. Oh, he he muted himself. Okay, you know, and I was going to get to uh, you know uh, when we talk about uh, restitution and, uh, and uh, you know you there's know, a. There's a there's, there's, oh, who's up there? there? You're on. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, you know, in Luke 19, 110, Zacchaeus, you know, to me, this is a very good story. It, it, it's about, a, you know, a rich man who came to Yeshua and not only believed, but he also made restitution for his uh, deliberate uh, sinful acts. He stood up and did something which, which the rich young ruler refused to do in Luke 18.22. Okay, Zacchaeus, from his own personal faith, chose to give half of what he owned to the poor and repay fourfold all that he had wrong. Here was the evidence that the Lord had changed his life. So we see, uh, we see in the word there are those that their life was changed, and then there were those that just walked away. That hey, I I can't do that, you know, like giving up everything I own, or or you know, so uh, you know, so so okay, we we have read from Hebrews, and uh, and 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 uh, Leviticus, but and you know, and it says Yeshua's death. Lot, you know, a lot of your Christian pastors will tell you that Yeshua's death was, was a once and for all sacrifice for all, all sins. <clears throat> but we have one big problem here, okay? Millennial sacrifices are mentioned, okay? As a matter of fact, by major prophets, okay, in the Tanakh uh, as a future, as future occurrences, you know, and at least four other prophets joining Ezekiel because it's, they always refer to Ezekiel. Everyone uh, talks about Ezekiel. Um, the, you know, when they talk about the sacrificial systems in the millennial temple. Mm -hmm. But in Isaiah, if anybody has, if somebody can open up to Isaiah, okay, Isaiah 56, 7. And then 66, 20 to 23. But first, 56, 7, what does it say? Does anybody have their microphone on? I'll bring, I'll bring them to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. They'll be welcome to worship the same as the insiders to bring burnt offerings and sacrifices to my altar. Oh, yes, my house of worship will be known as a house of prayer for all people. And that's in Isaiah. And we're talking about the millennial reign here. Okay. Now, how about 66, 20 to 23 in Isaiah? 66, 23. 20 to 23. 20 to 23. They'll return with all your long lost brothers and sisters from all over the world. They'll bring them back and offer them a, a living worship to God. They'll bring them on horses and wagons and carts and mules and camels straight to my holy mountain, Yerushalayim, says God. 
They'll bring them as just as the Israelites present their offerings in a ceremonial vessel in the temple of God. I'll even take some of them and make them priests and Levites, says God. That's interesting. That is. Yes. For just as the new heavens and the new earth I am making will stand firm before me, God's decree, so will your children and your reputation stand firm for month after month and week by week, everyone will come to worship me, God says. Amen. You see, and all this is in the millennial reign. So if you want to write it down, it's Isaiah 56, 7, and then 66, 20 to 23. So here's Here's, other than Ezekiel, I forgot to write uh, the portion I wanted to read in Ezekiel. 4424, that may have been it. But uh, Ezekiel speaks of a, a millennial reign of uh, bringing uh, sacrifices to the, to the temple. Okay, let's, let's jump over then to Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah, is he a prophet of the Lord? Absolutely. Jeremiah 33, 18. Does anybody, does anybody have a microphone in front of them and are at 33, 18? Maria, Heidi. Okay, Pastor well, Bruce. Well, I went, I went to Ezekiel 44, 24 because it e ties in. Okay, Ezekiel 44, 24. Then when there's a difference of opinion, the priests will arbitrate. They'll decide on the basis of my judgment laws and statutes. They are in charge of making sure the appointed peace are honored and my Sabbaths kept holy in the ways I've commanded. Amen. And then what scripture? Jeremiah 33, 18. 33, 18. And that there will always be Levitical priests on hand to offer burnt offerings present grain offerings and to carry on the sacrificial worship in my honor. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, is that a prophet? Yes. <clears throat> How about Zechariah? Okay, here's Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 to 21. Want me to read it? Yes. All the survivors from the godless nations that fought against Jerusalem will travel to Jerusalem every year to worship the king, God of the angel armies, and celebrate the Feast of Booths. If any of these survivors fail to make the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship the king, God of the angel armies. Oh, this, you know what? Let me switch. That's the message I got on there. It's kind of weird. Let me go to New American on that one. Okay. Sorry. The angel armies, I was thinking, wow, that's weird. Let me start over from 16. Then it will come about that any who are left in all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And it will be that whichever of the families of earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feast of Booth, Sukkot. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feast of Booths. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots of the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. You know, in, in uh, the sacrifices here, I heard one uh, commentator say, it's the grain offering. It's not, it's no other, it has, to have, but, but the thing is, is these offerings that we're talking about here, be it the grain offering, whatever offering it is, they are going to be present during the millennial reign, a future reign. Okay, I have one more. Do, should I do the last one before or go to the, let's go to uh, Lucy, we'll go to you first before I do the last one. Okay, just real quick on all these things we're reading now. Does it say in the millennial, like, like, is it before the verses that we read? 
like I'm trying to find context, context here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's but, the but it says that, right? Yes, they're all millennial scriptures. Yes. Every scholar agrees on that. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's I didn't what I hear that here at all. <clears throat> the word millennial. Right no. Yeah. So the word millennial you don't hear in the in the scriptures uh, so much, but uh, the the idea is conveyed. See that? Textual. Yeah. And that's why there's a lot of uh, you know, and that's what the scholars they all, all agree upon that, and that's why you find people they have problems with this because they know Yeshua was once and for all, never again. But when Yeshua comes back to rule and reign, we have these prophets that are talking about uh, sacrifices at this time. Go ahead, uh, Tila. Well, it's also yeah, it's also so important with the feasts. I mean, and the Sabbath. Yes. I mean, you know why the Christian Church doesn't understand? You know that the Moedim that all of this is so important. You know, right? Because it's all going to be continued on. It's going to be, and you're right. And and the last one I was going to hit on was Malachi, Malachi chapter three, three and four. Malachi chapter three, verses three to three to four. To yes, please. <laughs> he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Amen. Amen. You see, how many uh, of these prophets do uh, the Christian church hold on to? And they'll tell one well, no, they'll tell you that uh, they are all prophets, great men of men of God, but yet they they won't read this. Uh, Gary verses down is on tithing. On tithe, yeah. Oh, they'll read that one. <laughs> you know, every, you know the two thirds of the Bible that they ripped out. Well, they're going to take those pages and put them right back in. You know, so go ahead, Gary. It just seems to me that there's a lot more that is not said in what we read than what is said mm -hmm. in the sense of it says, yes, this is occurring, but it really doesn't say much more beyond that. And he talks about all these the people that went up against the survivors or whatever, and I yeah. guess they're just kind of, they're going to be all over the world, I suspect. I think of the logistics. Like right now, there's many people that are on the planet as far away as we are. I don't know about you, but it takes, it's like a 24 hours of flight time just to get to Israel and back. Right. And you think, okay, you got to go up three times a year. I think of the logistics. Right. Then you talk about the sacrifices. Okay, who is doing what? When and where, right? Because you've got Israel, you have the believers, shall we say? Are there other groups there? Mm -hmm. You know, who are the priests? I mean, there's just there's a whole lot more that is not said, right? Than what is said. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we want to make assumptions. From our current experience and read into things that aren't there. Well, you know, what I get from this is it's, it's exceptional, it's exceptional, exception, it's accepted uh, behavior at that time. This is something that's, that's accepted. The, the people are doing this because that is not just because the prophet said it. I know what you're saying. It's just like when you talk about uh, people coming uh, to Jerusalem, not 100% of the people in the world are going to be coming up to Jerusalem, but a representative of that, of those people, we can send a representative from the United States to Israel, and he's representing all of the people of the United States. Say that. You know, that's an acceptable assumption. You know, uh, it may be an, 
I think it's, it, well, see, you know. We'll, see what we're trying to do. No, but I'm not looking at this at the, at the sake of 21st century uh, ideas. I'm looking at it as, you know, what's accepted in the word. And, and uh, a prophet, if he's going to say something uh, and it's not going to come to pass, well, then he's not a prophet. I'm not saying it's not coming to pass. I'm just saying yeah. we invoke a whole lot of assumption because yeah. mm -hmm. this is our experience now. Mm -hmm. And we as humans, you know, if, if this is my experience, then I assume it's going to continue yeah. on in the future because of my experience. The thing I'm saying is perhaps these people that are doing the sacrifices need to be taught that process. Mm -hmm by us because they've never been in that process right i mean are we ourselves going to be participating in the right. sacrifices to me it seems well we've already paid our dues shall we say right. for lack of a better term so why do we need to go back and do that again right it you know or is perhaps the topography of the planet much different yeah yeah i mean the amount of olives is going to split yeah exactly you know, i mean there's a whole lot I don't think we have any idea or conception of what it's going to be like then. Yeah, exactly. I know what you're saying. And it yeah. just seems so much more speculative. Making, and what I've learned is once you start making assumptions, yeah. in other words, like when you put the answer in the blank and it's the wrong answer, you can't put the right one in it because <laughs> the wrong one's already there. And a lot of times, our assumptions prevent us from really finding the accurate but, answer. But how are you going to have a good midrash without assumptions? You know, well, assumptions no. are very, very, very dangerous. No, I, I know. Rather, yeah, I would rather leave the item blank and say I don't know. Well, it's an, an it's also an assumption that Yeshua is going to come and rule and reign. I mean, I wouldn't call that an assumption, but he's going to be there to rule and reign. And if this is the ex acceptable behavior of that, of that time, we don't read anywhere that he's coming against it. So what were you going to say? Uh, oh, Pastor Paul, go ahead, sir. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to unmute. Uh, the one thing I would say is we have to realize we're talking about three different eons or ages. We're talking about the age we're in now. We're talking about the fact that there's a heavenly reign. We're talking about a millennial reign that's coming. And then we're talking about a time after that. So uh, if we go back to the scripture, just Hebrews chapter 7, uh, it says, now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, and it goes on about all that, and I'm not against the fact that, yes, there are going to be sacrifices, yes, there will. But what we have to realize from chapter 7 is very clearly indicating that there are two priesthoods. Right. One priesthood is the Levit Levitical priesthood, which will never go away as long as the earth exists. The second is the Melchizedek priesthood, of which Yeshua is the high priest of that priesthood. There are going to be those that are of the Melchizedek priesthood, and there are going to be those that are under the Levitical priesthood, and the Jewish community is that group of people that's underneath that. Now, how is it going to be mixed, and how is it going to be worked? Well, we know this, the Levitical priesthood is by the order that we have that we understand. Yes. The priesthood of Melchizedek is a faith-based priesthood. Now, you can read it all the way through the book of Hebrews. It's all about faith. It's the whole point. It's pointing to the fact that that priesthood is going to operate on that basis. Now, Yeshua can rule and reign on this earth, in absolute faith, and there will be people in absolute faith walking in, on this earth and serving and doing all of that. The Levitical priesthood is not in a, opposition to faith. I mean, we must realize that everybody that did these sacrifices before the advent of Yeshua as Messiah on the earth 
they did all of this in faith. It was absolutely faith-based. They trusted that what God was telling them to do was going to accomplish what he said, which would make them acceptable to him, which would uh, absolve the, the sins that they had done. It covered those. They paid the price that was necessary because we all incur a debt whenever we sin. Well, those are the very things that Yeshua did, but that doesn't mean that that covenant is now gone away with. It right. just means that we have a fulfillment of it through Yeshua. And when he comes back and he rules and reigns, I'm willing to let him decide exactly what we're going to be doing Amen. and how we're going to be doing it. Amen. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have some serious... Uh... Torah studies uh, when we go. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. So go ahead, Gary. Here's a couple of questions. We're in the millennial reign. I assume we've been transformed to our new state of existence. Our heavenly body. <laughs> so far, so good. That's so far. Yeah. Okay. Let's say I'm building a temple and I'm moving a bunch of big rocks and one falls on me. Do I get crushed? No. Does it bounce off? Do I have an S on my chest? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We'll lift it off the wood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it possible for yeah. me to sin then? Yeah. Yeah. Not in your, not in your, not in oh. the. So if a block falls and it lands on me, I just roll it over and you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. Yeah. So I can't stub my toe. I yeah. can't break a leg. Yeah. I mean, these are the crazy things I yeah. think about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think about things like that. <laughs> but, uh, work out. but it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I see what you're saying, you know, but it's, uh, you, you know, when we're in, uh, when we go be with the Lord, I, Golly, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, to your point earlier, Gary, I mean, there is so much in the word of God that, that we assume. The word of God is not a detailed, chronological piece of work. It just isn't. It's a topical summary. It's a good, yeah. that's a, good that's a good, to put yeah. it. And so it's up to us to fill in the blanks and of course that's where the problems arise but you have to fill in the blanks in order to even operate i mean when the word says you know uh keep the sabbath day holy you've got to figure out what that means and and uh you know two jews three opinions uh, that's what happens and, and so i think we go from faith to faith so wherever your faith is now it's like Pastor Paul was saying, the, the Israelites, they moved in tremendous faith mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to take all that time off work three times a year, travel up to Jerusalem, right. take uh, livestock, which is uh, a precious commodity mm -hmm. uh, in an agrarian uh, society, and, and uh, just burn it up. Uh, you know, that takes faith. Uh, they had faith. They were operating in faith. Sometimes we think, well, we're operating in faith, but they were operating in works. No, the works was the expression of their faith, according to James. Yeah. Right. And so there's so much that we, we don't under, in Western culture, we don't understand the concept of sacrifice at all. Right. I mean, we, PETA gets in an uproar, and, and most of us get in an uproar thinking about slaughtering anim animals. Um, we assume we know what the Trinity is all about. We assume we know what the millennials are all about. The Bible doesn't even talk about heaven very much. Two little chapters, basically. But there's a lot of books written there's on it. There's a lot of books written on it. And that, uh, those books are all assumption. I'm not saying they're wrong. I don't know. And, and they can make a good case. But even the case goes to your point again. Uh, that uh, is based on our current understanding of things, right? which I sense is extremely limited right now. So for us even to write our greatest uh, Trieste would be, uh, you know, like 
see Jane run kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Even teaching on people come to me all the time. I want to, I want you to teach on Revelation. Well, I'm not ready for Revelation. I thought Revelation the first month I came to the Lord, I was more than ready. <laughs> but wrong. And now I realize I don't understand the book of Revelation. And I don't, I'm I haven't read anything that I think really hits it. Hmm. Right. So it, it's all assumption. Um, we have to really take that into account and not let that stumble us because the assumption that we make builds our faith right Doesn't it make us dig also? That's it. you know and that's yeah, i think dig. you're right it yeah. makes us dig yeah yeah, yeah. yes paul has got his hand up. oh paul one more time pastor paul <laughs> okay can you hear me at this point yes we can okay uh again in chapter seven this is an interesting verse one that always makes me realize we have to pay attention closely. It says in chapter seven, verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. We're very familiar with the laws that govern us at this point. We're even familiar with the laws that God laid down for the sacrifices and all of that business. But as we go on here and read in, in chapter 7, it goes on to say, and this is clear still. I skipped over some, but you guys need to read it to fill it in. I know we're getting close to close up time. And this is clear still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, now, interestingly enough, what God has done for us, he has provided you and me with an indestructible life, which means that there's a whole different dimension to who we are in Messiah than even those that walk according to the law that was first given in Torah. Now, we have to accept the fact that there's some different things going on and we operate under a different law and that law has changed. Now, how, what the law is changed to is what all of us are looking to try to discern and discover because we realize there was a law and it's still a vandal law. It's not done away with, but there is another law because of a change of priesthood that brings us to a different level of understanding and obligation. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, we'll end it right here in Roman numeral seven. Uh, five prophets affirm a sacrificial system in the millennial temple. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Malachi, and Ezekiel. So I know I threw a whole wrench into some of your uh, understandings, but, uh, but that's what's one thing that's great about uh, Torah study and our Midrash. Uh, we, everyone brings something to the table. So thank you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.